Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and joining me today for a discussion on the state of China's economy and the state of China's financial system is a very special guest, Dr. Xie Huaiju, who is Division Chief of the International Finance Research Bureau at the People's Bank of China, which is China's central bank. Welcome to the show, Dr. Xie. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's, it's my pleasure and honor to be talk here. It's very rare for us in India to yes. uh, have a chance to interview uh, a representative from the Chinese Central Bank. Uh, you obviously have uh, a difficult job. Mm -hmm. uh, managing the Central Bank of any large economy is uh, not, not an easy task. You, of course, are part of the research uh, uh, section and you are part of a larger team. But uh, what we hope to do in the next 20 minutes is to uh, get your insights into questions that people in this country have about what's happening with the Chinese economy. For the last 30 years, uh, in India and around the world, we've got used to the idea of China being the engine of global economic growth. Mm -hmm. Chinese economy grew at double digits and uh, exported its stuff all around the world, was a source of, is a source of investment, uh, is, you know, has essentially kept global growth rates ticking along. But what we've seen over the last three or four years is a slowdown, uh, which has raised questions about um, what's happening with the Chinese model. Is this, as some critics say, the end of the road of the Chinese model? Or is this uh, a period of transition as China matures from a uh, high growth economy, which was at earlier stages of development to a more mature industrial economy? Uh, so what's your sense of the big picture? Why are we seeing the kind of slowdown that we've seen uh, in the Chinese economy over the last few years? Um, thank you for this question, which is a critical question, not only um, <clears throat> for today, but also for the policymakers and the regulators in China. And let me first begin uh, our discussion from the, the work of the central bank. And uh, what should the central bank react? <clears throat> That's my work uh, and colleagues of my <clears throat> institution do. So uh, we basically react at the shocks. So basically, uh, naturally, there is uh, three kind of shocks. The first is a short-term shocks, like uh, uh, Paris uh, terrorism uh, attack. So uh, there is a shock, and it's going to have some implication and impact on the global financial markets. Right. But generally, the uh, central bank don't react on that, because this is only a short-term innovation, and so it, we're gone. And if you react on that, it's going to have at least a medium term implication in fact. Exactly. So the second and the third uh, kind of shocks is um, the, the second one is cyclical shock and the third one is structural, structural. shock. Okay. So now let's come out the slowing down of Chinese economy. Is that a uh, <clears throat> cyclical shock or is that a structural one? If that is a cyclical one that means your potential growth rate is uh, 10 percent. So now it's seven or a little bit under the seven. So you have a net, you have a net negative output gap. So you have to react against that because it's a cyclical shock. Yes. But if your potential rate in the long term, which is the potential rate, is a long term equilibrium rate, have go down to some extent like two, uh, seven to eight or something like that around that. So now you don't have a net out of the gap. So it's a structural shock. You don't have to react to that at, that at this very moment, but you have to think about what your policy could fa facilitate this structural change. Right. So this is our first work to talk about, is it a cyclical or is it structural? To my view, from my point of view, I think it's a structural change. Why it's a structural change? Why it's the <coughs> slowing down of the potential growth Let's go back to the history, the human history about industrialization. So let's do some uh, analysis about the growth at the very stage. Comparative analysis. Uh, a, a comparative analysis yeah. about the uh, Netherlands uh, 200 years before, and UK and US 100 years before, and then Japan 15 years before. You can see that um, 
the relatively maintain a very high growth, averagely at 10% for some years. For China, the record is three decades, or a little bit more than three decades. Which is much more than any of these other countries. Yes, right? already. Yeah. But uh, they keep them for a period, and then they go to the seventh stage. The second stage is something six to eight, or roughly around that, more or less, uh, less than eight percent, or something like that. And the third, uh, for Japan and for UK and US, they go to the third stage, and also other European countries. It's uh, roughly at, uh, for Germany, it's good at five percent, and the other uh, EU companies, the two or three percent of this. So you can see. Japan, it's virtually zero. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. That's three stages. So it's normal and it's natural for economies to, uh, to, to get the whole process. So let's uh, do some analysis about the production function of that. So uh, no matter what form of produ production function you take, so the growth, your long-term potential growth come from five components. The first is a technology or TFP, whatever you say, that is a residual. And uh, the growth of the input of the other uh, factors, like the, the second component is the growth of labor input. And the third component is the marginal return of labor. And the fourth component should be the uh, growth or uh, growth and increment of the <coughs> input of capital. And the fifth one is the marginal return of the capital. So it was decided by your endowment for each country. At the very beginning, let's call that industrialization period. I know you may have a debate um, on whether it's industrialization. Uh, could some, 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 some nation or economy could have a, not a growth, like a, a more uh, services oriented. Right. But uh, if we're talking about these economies, they are manufacturing oriented and industrialized countries. So at the very first stage, you have a, a relatively abundance of the supply of labor Maybe. and relatively a scarcity of the capitals. So what's the style as the fact at the very first this big uh, stage? So that is a depressed wage because uh, the labor plus and uh, enhanced profitability because of the scarcity uh, capital, capital or something like that. So that is a depressed consumption and a high growth investment at a very stage. So you got a high potential. And after that, after a period of time, uh, because of the because of your uh, endorsement, so in going uh, gradually and naturally to the second stage, because you have used up all your labor uh, <coughs> resources, right. like what happened now in China. Why you can see some uh, the data and the statistics about China that uh, the labor cost, uh, union labor cost, and also the wage, um, the growth, yeah. the going yeah. up yeah. is uh, outpaced the growth of GDP. And it was depressed for many years, like 30 years, because there is a Foucault system. You, you may already know that uh, the migration workers, right. they don't get so the same pay. Uh, so workers needed a work permit to go from one province to the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, in the second stage, uh, you don't have any additional gain from a two component at least. The first is you don't have additional labor input. You have to use up all that, that. and you don't have uh, uh, because the marginal, diminishing marginal uh, return from the label. When the label is uh, flu uh, through the whole countries, now they can get the, uh, you, you, the marginal product is going down. Yes. So for the second stage, it's very natural that you are going to have a long-term, low, slowing down the long-term equilibrium growth rate. So that is the second stage. I call that uh, capital deepening the stage or something like that. Right. So I think uh, China is moving from the very first stage um, to the second stage. China is now experiencing a transition uh, period. And we're going to view some stylized, uh, stylized effects in this uh, So moving period. from one steady state yeah, to, to another, another steady, steady state, state is essentially state. what you're saying. Yeah, that's essentially what right. I say. So uh, before it's depressed consumption, now it's a burst of consumption because if you're looking at the macroeconomic data now here in China, you found that um, <coughs> the share, um, the wage share in the national income have gone up gradually. So they are going to be the trigger and they are going to be the engine for the consumption. But, consum but consumption is still 
I mean, if you compare the yes. Chinese economy to yes. any OECD yes. economy, yes, consumption is hardly 40% of GDP. We, we are at the very beginning of okay. the second stage. So you're saying that, 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 that as, as the transition process completes, yes. Yes. the share of consumption will rise up to OECD exactly. levels? Sixty yeah, percent? So. Yes, yeah. exactly. I think so. It's a, it's a natural. So theory, by, by theory, it should be right, okay. right? And how about the invest, investment? You're talking about the slowing down of investment yeah. because it's a compressed uh, pr profitability okay. for the COVID. So that's my logic. Now, 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 the reason why there's been so much of international concern yes. uh, is because I think there's confusion about whether the slowdown is, as you say, cyclical or, or uh, structural, structural, right? Yeah. And Part of the reason why there is confusion is because what you are saying, what you are describing as a structural shift, yes. the process seems to begin and take hold mm -hmm. at uh, around 2008, 2009, 2010, when you have a global financial crisis, global slowdown. So there's a sense in which there is a cyclical element to this as well. Yeah, it's a and in some element. ways, the Chinese government has also responded, uh, initially at least, uh, to the slowdown as if it were a cyclical. Yes, Slow because down. at that time, uh, there have shown some structural change yeah. in the macroeconomic data, but uh, the global uh, financial crisis coming and the slack come. So government have to or misunderstood the situation, okay. so react um, as if it's, um, it's, so it's a cyclical thing. So now we're in, in the trend, it's both cyclical because, you know, the build up of the liability and the build up the leverage um, after the 2008. Right. So for me, it's both cyclical and also uh, structural, but mainly the structural change. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've seen in, in some on the political side uh, for the last seven or eight years in statements made by Chinese leaders, uh, the need to enhance domestic consumption. Yes. Uh, I think even the latest uh, plenum of the CPC has spoken about this. Uh, uh, how important a policy direction is that for you and the PBOC to help the structural Trans transition towards greater and greater domestic consumption? Um, I, will, I will talking about not only uh, towards uh, the greater consumption, I think the, uh, it's a natural process okay. and the market is going to decide it where to go. So uh, for PBOC, uh, as I have already said, if it's not a cyclical condition, we don't usually uh, react very often to, yeah. to the condition, but we could uh, facilitate uh, enabling and a favorable framework for the shifting and so uh, our work now is uh, some uh, something like a structural reform what kind of reform is uh, uh, if you uh, going back to to look at the economic reform for China which is to liberalize a different market at the very first is a it's a product market and then it's the factor markets like the labor market yeah. the labor market is uh, is liberalized in uh, 1998 and you see the migration uh, the, the, the the huge migration even in the human history uh, in the contemporary time but now uh, there is a last uh, area we haven't uh, f uh, set free or we haven't uh, liberalized uh, that is the interest rate which is the price for the la price for the capital so if you look at the PBOC's um, recent policy the very important policy is we we uh, liberalize we lift up to all the regulation on the interest rate. Right. It's going to be uh, tremendously helpful uh, for the for the factor, especially the factor of the capitals, to move and to help the uh, commercial banks to find the right place uh, to find to form the right price for the right product okay. and to the right clients. But we've so, seen over the last uh, year or eighteen months. Uh, interest rates falling steadily. Yes, that's a good place. Uh, that's but, a good time. But it hasn't resulted in increased credit offtake or increased investment. So why is that happening? I mean, you've liberalized on, on the interest rates front. Yes. But companies don't seem to be responding in looking a conventional at, way. Look, looking at what happened to US and the UK, so the accumulation of the access reserve, right? So the central bank, what they can do is base money. After that, the other thing is the so whole banking system. If they think there is some economic slack, or they don't react on that. So the monetary uh, <coughs> multiplier is going down. So I agree that uh, um, I, I agree that the central bank they can do part of the work, but on this side, uh, the transition uh, mechanism uh, should be should be more smooth. When, uh, when the economic uh, uh, condition and the circumstance going better. Right. So what Keynes called the animal spirits, 
they seem to be missing right now, right? You've lowered the interest rates, but companies aren't biting. Uh, they are not. They are not react on that. Yeah. So it's definitely in U.S. at the very beginning of the of the depression, and also uh, you can see the the huge decline about their monetary uh, multiplies and the accumulation about the excess reserve from the banking system in the central bank. Okay. So, uh, so um, kind of understandable. Yes. Let's turn to the banking system itself, uh, where which is a special area of concern for PBOC. Yes. Uh, there have been reports in in the Western financial press about. Uh, you know, lack of lack of transparency about uh, stressed assets in the banking system. Uh, we see reports that banks may be undercapitalized. I know that the Chinese government has been uh, trying to uh, push the banking system. You have the Basel III requirements, mm -hmm. which they're trying to fulfill and you know to, to raise capital for. But how would you assess today the state of health of the Chinese banking system as a whole? Are there any reasons why the world should be concerned? Uh, it should be, it shouldn't be concerned. But to me, it's still very challenging because you know the condition is very cyclical. So at this stage of the cyclical change about the conditions, so it's easy for the bank uh, to uh, to uh, add up the, their <coughs> NPL to some extent. But averagely now the uh, is the, uh, the NPL ratio is under you know, the non-performing uh, non assets. The non-performing yeah. assets yeah. uh, is the um, is the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, below t uh, two percent, and the international standard of that right. is four percent. Right. So, um, if you do some international uh, comparative analysis, I think uh, it's okay. But still, uh, um, uh, PBOC has uh, <coughs> closely looked at this area and to try to uh, avoid uh, to try to avoid uh, the systematic uh, financial stability risk on that. So, it's challenging but um, uh, shouldn't be cautious on that. Is, there, uh, is the fact that a large part of the Chinese economy and Chinese enterprises are still state-owned, is that, is that also um, a source of problem for the banking system? In other words, does it mean that banks, certain decisions that banks take uh, are driven politically rather than by prudential banking norms? No, I don't norms? think so. I think that the question is about the structure of the financial market of China. If you're looking at the funding market of China, 80% are coming from the credit of the banks, and the other percent, other 20% are coming from equity markets yeah. and bond markets. So that is, uh, when you learn money from, from uh, when you borrow money, sorry, borrow money from, uh, from the banking system, you have a very high leverage of that. So when the, when the cyclical situation is uh, is going down, is uh, <clears throat> uh, um, so you will have uh, you will have some problem both from the probability uh, right. of the firms and then the NPL uh, NPL ratios with a bank or something right. like that. Right. So our policy uh, agenda and our policy. Uh, objectives and a target in the near future is um, is to foster a healthy development about the equity markets and let the uh, direct financing mechanism to play a more important role in the whole financial system. Yeah, so I don't think it's uh, have some link to with that. So it's just structural. It's a quite a different structural than what we have in US and UK. Right, but the transition that you're speaking of uh, assumes that the equity market is stable, transparent, and well-performing. And we've seen in the last year some volatility in the equity market. And the response of Chinese regulators to restore uh, stability was not very effective. Is this an area of concern as well? Uh, it's not. A, it's not a concern. Or a challenge, as you say. It's huh? a challenge of concern. Okay. I, I mean uh, that uh, Chinese government is uh, is very successful on some experimental gradualism, and they learn the lessons very quickly. So uh, you have to you have to uh, tolerate a little bit um, about the mistake or um, during the uh, growing process. Uh, although we are the second largest economies now in the world, but we are very young compared to other economies. And we are very young uh, compared to the uh, financial regulation and, and uh, financial security and something like that. So we have to be tolerant on that. And the Chinese government now have the, have the <coughs> uh, have or, have already uh, make the uh, have already uh, uh, struck not not struggled. They are worked very hard to the new framework. So I have the uh, I personally have the confidence on that. Okay. Yes. Now, if we turn to the international side of uh, the Chinese financial system and PBOC, 
uh, where do you see, uh, what role do you envisage for the Yuan at the international level? I've seen statements in the past by PBOC uh, governors or chairman that uh, China Chinese side wants the Yuan to be a more international reserve currency. We know that uh, China wants the Yuan to be part of the SDR, uh, you know, the basket of currencies at the IMF for special drawing rights. What's your sense of where uh, China would like the kind of role the yuan to play internationally? Uh, well, at the first, we don't have a time agenda for that. And uh, it was the framework was begin at 2009. And at the very first beginning, we just uh, uh, lift up some restriction for, uh, for the cross-border use of RMB. Because China is the number one uh, trade entity, trade economist in the world. So a lot of the co co corporate, they have, the, they have uh, FX um, exposures. So they need to use their own currency. So uh, the whole policy framework for the cross-border use of our uh, RMB is free is set free or liberalized at first from the current account and then move into the move into the financial and the capital account so uh, to me it's also a very natural process on that so after six years uh, from 2009 and until now uh, china is uh, number four uh, settlement currency in the world um, but if you if you look at the percentage of that, um, the number one is USD, and the percentage the, the, the gap is huge. So the percentage for RMB um, <coughs> settlements is uh, relatively uh, more or less two uh, percent. So uh, still a long way to go, and I think um, PBOC and RMB have uh, no uh, ambition to uh, challenge the state of US USD. And if we're looking at is that, that because uh, you have you have trillions of dollars in uh, in, in dollar denominated I so. assets? I don't think so. Okay. If you're looking at the internalization history, okay. and it's taking uh, more than half a century or sixty or seventy years for USD become the number one currency, internationalized currencies. So still a long way to go, and uh, we're on that process, but uh, we don't have a huge ambition on that. Right. And uh, the SDR, uh, how important is that? that the RMB be included in the uh, IMF's SDRs? I think we welcome uh, the conclusion uh, of, uh, you know there is a statement from the uh, Mrs. Lagarde, uh, Christine already, and, but uh, the decision rest with um, the decision of the executive board. Right. We welcome the board and we will respect, the, respect their decision on that. And the statement of the Madam Lagarde, uh, Christine, I think there's a con uh, and uh, the staff, uh, there is a staff report on the RMB's inclusion into the uh, SDR basket. I think it's an acknowledgement about the development uh, of Chinese economy and the financial reforms. So we welcome their um, uh, review on that. Most financial analysts uh, argue that uh, inclusion of RMB in the IMF's special drawing rights basket uh, is significant for China, not so much because of any any implications this has for trading or finance, mm. but as a way of expressing China's uh, insistence that go the governance structure in the IMF needs to change to reflect the realities of today's global economy. Let's mark it to say, right. for Chinese authorities in the central bank, we just do our business now. Right. We, we, a lot of, we have a lot of things to address and tackle in the domestic market right. and the condition. So uh, to be honest, I, I don't think it's our, it's our concern okay. on the internalization and inclusion of that. Right. You've spoken like a true banker, Dr. Shia. Thank you very much for joining us on RSTV. Thank you very much. Bye. That wraps up this episode of Indian Standard Time. Do join us again next week with another guest.